another episode of Experiencing God. We start on our Unit 1 this week. Last week we had our introduction and we hope that you enjoyed that. Uh, this is just to continue what we started last week. The book itself is called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, Claude King. This book is very important for you. If it's all possible, order the book. You can go to any Christian bookstore Lifeway, Amazon, or go online and type in the word Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, and you'll be able to pull that up. This book is on sale, I believe, at, on Amazon right now, so you can get that at a reduced rate, a uh, few dollars, but it's a very important book, something that you will probably need, but if you have your Bibles with you, that is very important today as well. So we're going to do the study and what we're going to do is just to expose you to some of the things that you need to know about experiencing God. Now, the very first thing that we want to say is that you have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. If that is, hasn't happened, or you're still waiting on to find out who you're going to serve, then uh, it's fruitless for us to go any further. This study is based on Christians that truly have not found out what the will of God is and how they can work with God in performing and completing his will. So we want to make sure that you are a child of God. Uh, let's begin with uh, Romans chapter 3, and it deals with uh, the subject, what we call uh, the Roman road. But in our studies, these are scriptures that are a part of chapter 1 or chapter 3 verses uh, 23 in Romans 23. And uh, these verses will help us to understand who we are and where we are in Christ. For Romans 3.23 first of all says that we all have sinned. We all sin us. You can't deny that regardless of how you look at it. We all sinned from the day that we were born. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Okay? So let's get on past that and recognize the fact and accept the fact that we are sinners. Now, once you accept that, then the next step is to look at Romans 6, 23. And it says that, that uh, eternal life is a free gift. It's all free from God. It lets us know that God has not put a price on what we pay for our salvation. He gave his soul. He sent his son Jesus to die upon the cross for us. So uh, it's not a matter of uh, you paying for it. It's a free gift. And then Romans 5, 8. For the love of God, Jesus paid the price with his death. He paid with his, his body. His death was the price that he paid so that we could have the opportunity to serve him. And then it comes down to the confession where you see in Romans 10, uh, the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10. It says, confess with your mouth. Confess the Lord Jesus. You believe that he rose from the grave. You believe that he sits on the right hand of the Father right now, interceding for you. And it says, you shall be saved. Romans 13, or 10, 13, and it gives you an invitation to ask God to save you. If you ask that and you truly believe it in your heart, that you were serving the true and living God, that Jesus is the Son of God, then you shall be saved. And so that's the very first step of experiencing God, is to accept him, number one. 
Accept that he came to die for our sin. Accept that we just celebrated Christmas, recognizing the birth of Jesus Christ. And now we must grow in Christ. We must fulfill the, the need and fulfill the uh, uh, opportunity that he's given us to walk the face of this earth. He's given us a challenge. He's given us a, a, a chance to do the things that he is planned to do on this earth. He wants his people to do it, but he wouldn't do it through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus was an example. He showed us the way. He showed us that this is the right way to do it because all the laws that the Pharisees and Sadducees would go over all from the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy uh, about the law, the laws that Moses wrote, they couldn't keep them. Nobody could keep the laws. They wanted you to keep them. The, the, the hierarchy, the high priests, the you know Pharisees wanted you to keep the laws, but then they didn't adhere to the laws. So we were left with a dilemma. And God put up with this for so many years. And then he said, here's, here's a solution. Since I see that you, you cannot keep the laws, I'm going to send somebody to earth made in the form of man to fulfill the law. And that was Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill the law, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law for us. And so the prerequisite for experiencing God is having a relationship with Jesus. And we got to look more in our own experience to experience God. God works through people, through experiences in life. And I have some video clips we will show later on in our program, uh, some of the things that God has done through me, with me, to bring about his will. Amen? If you recognize that you need help, you can call on someone. This video is going to be on YouTube, so you can see it over and over again as often as you wish. But if you have somebody that is closely related to you, that you trust, uh, somebody perhaps that's a pastor or a Sunday school teacher, somebody that knows the Word of God, not just a personal friend that uh, tells you what you want to hear, but somebody that will tell you and speak to you the truth then you can refer to these people to help you in understanding these scriptures. Uh, we all need help. We can't do it by ourselves. So if you're ready, we will begin our study this evening and hope that you will experience God in a very special way. As I say, Jesus is your way. He's the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And our scripture passage for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that are come from the Spirit of God. For he to him it is foolishness. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So for a man that doesn't know the will of God or have no experience with God, the spirit is not in him. He can't interpret what God is saying. He can't take these scriptures and put them to heart and, and, and work from them to have a better life in this world and to make a better life for our people. The Bible lets us know that the Holy Spirit will be your personal teacher. John 14, 26 it says, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And that's the scripture. That's the source where we get all of our interpretation of the will of God. The Holy Spirit will be our personal teacher. It will teach us how to do things in a way that we may not normally do. Because the things of the world are spiritually discerned from what God is doing. They can't understand it. It's all gibberish to them. You know, they may think you're drunk or crazy when you try to apply the word of God, you know, to them. But God lets us to know, wants us to know 
that he will determine and give us a discernment of the things that we need to know and do to experience God. So we must look to, more to God in your experience each day. Look to God and find out where he's working. God is always at work. He's working 24-7. Uh, he doesn't sleep. He can come to you in a dream, in a vision, on a postcard or a bus stop or uh, uh, just uh, any type of piece of paper can fly through the air with the word of God on it. That's how God, how powerful God is. And when you experience God, you will be able to see these things that are happening in your life and recognize that, wow, that's God. Your ultimate relationship with God cultivates through prayer, meditation, and the Holy Bible, the Bible studies. You got to have some quiet time, my brothers and sisters. You can't do it by running out, doing all the things of the world, and not giving God any time to communicate with you. Prayer is the most important key to our relationship with Christ. Because then we are asking God to do something through prayer and then wait for the results. The Bible lets us know that many times before we even pray, God has already answered us. Now there comes a prerequisite with that as well. Your heart's got to be right. Your heart got to be right with God. Stony heart can't get to God. When you uh, humble yourself and ask God to come into you, that's why we went over the uh, Romans road in the beginning of our study tonight, to make sure that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And from that point, you can work on toward knowing and doing the will of God. It's from that point. But a sinner cannot work from uh, on into knowing the will of God because he has not accepted him in his heart. And when I say accept him in the heart, that means that you believe with all your heart and soul that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he sits on the right hand of him right now interceding for you, that you can be saved. And then there's the meditation. Now, I, I share this with my church uh, that many times I pray and I'm speaking to God. But often the results come when I'm meditating on God, when I'm waiting to hear what he has to say. I got a lot to say to God. I can ask him for this. I can ask him for the moon, the stars, and everything else. But then when I wait on him and allow him to speak to me, in that still, quiet voice, in a dream, in a vision, whatever way he chooses, then I know that I'm on the right track in doing the will of God. Because he has to set the tables. I can't speak to God and say, well, this is what I'm going to do, God. It doesn't work like that. I pray to God and ask him, what can I do for you? And I think I shared that in a testimony uh, in our introduction, how I asked God, was well, there something I could do for him before I leave this earth. And he gave me a mission. And so that's the mission that I'm on at this particular time. Everything around me involves what God wants me to do. So I meditate on that until he gives me instructions. There have been some ups and downs, some ins and outs, some hard times. Just like Saul, uh, Paul conversion, from that point on, it wasn't an easy road for him. Matter of fact, the road got even rougher because he was doing the will of God. And the enemy comes after you when you want to do the will of God. So in my meditation, I wait for God to answer. Like I was sharing with one of our members this Sunday, if there's something that's really bothering you and you are a child of God, you wrestle with God. You go on your knees and you say, I'm going to stay here until I get some results. And see, won't God move in your life? See, won't he turn that situation around? And he's already waiting to turn our situations around if we will only ask him and allow him to work it out. 
Not get up off your knees and go back and, and try to fix the situation yourself. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't work like that. He works in his own time. His ways are not our ways. And that's what we want to get you to begin to see and realize. When you're doing it under the power of the Holy Spirit, then we have the power to combat all kinds of uh, evil and sickness and disease. And then the Bible. You got to read his word. You got to study. You got to get involved in God's word. We just can't fill our minds every day with the things of the world and then expect to have spiritual things to solve our problems. We've got to be on top of everything. You can experience whatever's going on in the world. God gives you 24 hours a day. Now, if you choose to put, put uh, 12 hours in the day, good. But then give God 12 hours. But God doesn't even ask for the 12 hours. He said, can you stay with me just one hour? He told the disciples. He was going up into the mountain to pray. He said, can you pray with me just one hour? And that's more important than anything else in the world. It's more important even than, than reading the scripture because when you're praying, you're going directly to God. You're talking directly to him. This Bible is, is a representation of God. But when you can speak to God for him yourself, go directly to the throne of grace and ask God to solve your problems. That is the will of God. We read this book because it takes us to the throne of grace. Amen? Amen. So that intimate relationship with God, cultivated through prayer, meditation, and Bible study, will be an indispensable part of this course. You can't do it without it. You got to have some prayer, you got to have some meditation, and you surely got to study the Word of God. On page 10 of day one, the goal is not to finish this course, but to have a life transforming encounter with God. Don't worry about the course. We may not get to chapter two if you can experience God. But the thing is to have a transforming encounter with God. When you meet God for yourself, that's it. <laughs> you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to worry about falling back into a relapse, you know, going backwards, falling out of the will of God, because then the Holy Spirit takes over. When you first have that encounter with God, there ain't no turning back. I can assure you of that. When I had a real encounter with God, hey, I dropped, the scales dropped off, everything dropped off. That pocketbook dropped off. When I was dipped in the water, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, everything that was a part of the world went down in the water. And when I come up, I come up a new creation. And that's what experiencing God wants you to do, to be a new creation for him. Can't put it any other way. Jesus is your map. He laid the way. He's the road map. He, he set the standards. Came here born in a little stable, humble. They were looking for a king to come in on, a, a, you know, in chariots, parading down the street, red carpet laid out, throwing all kind of little trinkets at him. But he came in on the back of a donkey in his mother's womb. Couldn't find a place to stay. Had to go to a stable. Put together a manger made of wood. That's where he was born. But the world knew it. The world knew he was born because it was the will of God. And they say a shining star led the wise men to where he was. That's how God works. He don't work all the time through the way we expect him to work. If you do everything Jesus tells you, one day at a time, you will always be in the center of where God is working. We must always 
find out where God is working and go there and join him. Following one day at a time. We can't go ahead of God. We can't go to where God is working and say, oh, I got it now, God. I can take it from here. Doesn't work like that. We must stay right there until God says, we're going to move on a little further. And I think that's why he gave instruction to Abraham to go to a place. He didn't tell him exactly where to go. Because he knew that if he told him, you know, where to go, and then he would get there and he would have everything under his control. But he leaves us uh, hanging sometime just so we can follow him and not he follow us. So if you do everything God's will, God in God's will, then you will be on the right track with knowing and doing the will of God. Jesus is your model. As we look into the uh, exercises in day two, this is a day by day study of God's will. Jesus watched to see where the Father was at work. And he joined him. So Jesus takes his instructions from the Father. He never do more than what the Father asks him to do, nor what the Father is doing. He don't take it for granted. Lord, I'm going to build you a temple. I'm going to put this, 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 such and such into the temple. But God doesn't work like that. He has to lay the foundation. He's the foundation for your life, the foundation for this world. And he'll be the foundation until he comes back for his church. Look to see what God says and how he works in the scriptures. So God works through this word, this infallible word of God. He tells us exactly what he wants us to do. Make no uh, bones about it. If it's not in this word, then God doesn't want us to do it. It's not important. It's not necessary. We can't say, well, God didn't put it in the scripture, so I can do what I want. No, you can't. Because anything outside of the will of God is sin. And that's the difference. God put his infallible word in this book. Now, he didn't write everything that he could possibly. He wrote the things that were important for you in life. Bible tells us if he had to write everything that he had thought and wanted to write in this book, there wouldn't be enough space on the earth to cover the, to hold the books. Let me uh, uh, give you a little example. Here's a little uh, illustration, and you can answer them true or false, and I'll come back at the end and give you the correct answer. Can I, number one, can I trust my experiences as an effective way to know and follow God? Can you? Can you expect your experiences to be an effective way to know and follow God? The answer to that what is false. You can't trust your experiences because you have no, no guidelines, no foundation to your experiences. Now you do have experience uh, foundation with God if you work through him. How about this one? Number two, I should always elevate my experiences based on the truth I find in God's word. Always elevate your experiences on the truth you find in God's word. Uh, that's as true as you want to get it. Because if you do it any other way, you're out of the will of God. One more and we'll move on. I may get a distorted understanding of God if I do not check my experience against the truth of Scripture. Whatever you're doing, if it doesn't, if Scripture doesn't validate it, it's distorted. So in that particular case, you have to always test your experience 
with the word of God. And it's backed up by scripture. Amen. So the Bible is your guide. God didn't put anything in this book that's going to lead you in a path to a path of destruction. So many things, so many people, lives have ended in tragic situations because they failed to heed the word of God. I'm talking about Christian people. Christian people that sometimes they want to read God's word and interpret it in their own understanding, in a worldly understanding. You can't do it like that. You must do it through God's will. Amen? What is God's will? So many people don't understand what God's will is. When people seek to know and do God's will, many ask the question, what is God's will for my life? One of my seminary uh, professors said that if you ask the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. So the wrong question is not what is God's will for my life, but what is God's will? What is God's will? If you find out what God's will is, then you go and join God doing whatever his will is. And that is the will of your life. So you have to adjust your life to God's will. I've got a uh, clip that I'm going to show you. We were in Kenya and the Lord took 52 of us missionaries to Kenya on a missionary journey and we were there for two weeks. In that two week period we led over 7,000 souls to Christ. And so I want you to check out this video. This is a experience that we had no understanding, had no premonition that we would be in that situation to lead so many people to the Lord. But it was God's will. And we obeyed God's will. Check out this video. We'll be right back. To make something of my life. My roommate and I went to a party one Saturday night in the rich town of San Diego. And this was the worst disaster of my life. My friend overdosed from drugs and died that night. I was devastated and believed I might lose my mind. So I traveled back home. And for six months I did nothing but rest and began to attend church I had attended at age 12. One day God spoke to me and told me to go back to California. I met a lady and began to date. And she invited me to church. I met the pastor. I listened to one of his sermons. And the Lord did the rest. I gave my heart and soul to Jesus and my whole life changed from that day. I 
You believe that God can move in your life like He did in mine? Every each one will choose Jesus for yourself. She can't choose for you, and you can't choose for uh, it's personal. He comes into your heart. He deals you with his spirit. And then you have a new uh, new body, you have a new spirit, a new mind. Things you used to do, you don't want to do anymore. Would you like to accept Jesus today? No, when that's a good thing, I'm yes, Mary, Mary, would you like to accept Jesus today? As your Lord and Savior.
exciting. That uh, particular clip on the end there, there was a little clip about the water running upstream. In Kenya, there's a little place uh, right outside of Machakos that uh, the elevation causes the water to run upstream. And I was able to see that miraculous. But the ministry itself, we did the uh, evangelism. Uh, we were out there in the fields, in the villages each and every day bringing souls to Christ and many souls, many souls came to the Lord because we were doing God's will. And so those are things that when you accept Jesus, excuse me, accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, find out where he's working and join him and you will be doing God's will. In our world today, we know that God is at work He's showing himself to us each and every day. If you look at things that are happening in our world in the political arena, things that are happening uh, in our schools, in our courts, it's almost uh, unbearable to turn on the television and watch the news anymore because it's all bad news. But this is when God's at work at his best. How can we help? bring this situation about. Find out what God is doing. God is going to show us some things that he is doing to bring about these situations. And a lot of times, it's not the, the good situations that God uses. Sometimes it's the traumatic ones, the, the drama that, that goes into it. To expose the world to the lies and the deceit that's going on in our world today. And then we, as children of God, have to correct that. We don't have to go along with the lies, the indignation and the putting down of, of Christ, the weeding him out of all the religious institutions and all of our political institutions and our judicial system. These things are happening. So God is at work. He's showing us our imperfections and how we can join him and turn this situation around. I was sharing with some friends the other night. If we just stand up as Christians and let our voice, well, in prayer today, stand up as Christians and let our voice be heard. Speaking the word of God, speaking under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the spirit that leads and guides us to say what we say. Like Moses said, Lord, I can't talk. Why you want to send me down to Egypt? I can't tell, talk to those people. He said, don't worry about that. Open your mouth and I'll speak through you. And that's what the will of God will do for you in your life. You don't have to know a thing about the Bible. You don't have to know a thing about politics. You don't have to know anything about our judicial system. Let the Lord speak to you. And I guarantee you, he will tell you what to say. If you're put into a courtroom and you don't know what to say, let the Lord speak through you. He'll lead you and guide you. That's God's will. John 15, or John 5, 17, so he's always at work. He never sleeps. He's always on the job. He's always waiting to lead somebody through the Holy Spirit to direct us and tell us what to do. He gives us that spirit of discernment, which is the best uh, 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 tool we can have in our arsenal. When he tells you this is the right thing to do or this is not the right thing to do, turn this way and not turn that way. I have another clip that I'm going to show you about a young man that was undecided about his faith and his, his 
spiritual beliefs. And we're going to share that a little bit later. But I, I want you to know that God works in so many ways that you would not expect him to work. He says, my ways are not your ways. So don't expect him to come to you uh, the same way you come to you adventure or venture out into life every day. God will do the exceptional. I saw a news clip on the news today where a lady was driving an RV and her husband was in the passenger seat. She hit the rail of the freeway, threw her husband over her, out of the window, onto the freeway. He rolled and rolled and rolled. Not a car hit him and come out with very few scratches. You tell me that ain't God at work. God, and when he, <laughs> they interviewed him on the news, he said he couldn't stop praising the Lord. He said no matter what he do, he has found out what God's will is for his life. And he's going to preach it and teach it until the day he died. He was convicted of that. He said for the last 24 hours, he had not, not stopped speaking the word of God and how thankful he, are, he was to the word, to God saving his life. That's the will of God. God has to take us through these valleys sometimes, through these peaks, to show us his power. But when he gets to get his point across, it's just like Jonah. When he lets you know that he's for real, you will do his will. I thank God for that. In day three, let's, let's look at day three. One of the realities of day three is God's at work. So he's always at work around us. And we must continue to learn. Learn to be a servant of God. We're not someone that God gives things to. We don't ask him to, uh, Lord, do this for me and do this for me. I need help here. You don't call upon him until you need something. Well, call upon him when you want to do something for him. And let him be the, the, the potter that molds your clay. You know, we, we're not going to be the, 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 the potter. Let God be the potter. Let him mold us into the uh, fabric or the shape that he wants us to be. My understanding of a servant is depicted in the potter and the clay in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. The clay has to be molded. It has to be uh, responsive to the potter so that he can mold it in the image that he wants it to be. Now, the clay doesn't know what design or what image it wants to be, but it's left into the hand of the potter. Let God mold us into what he wants us to be. Let's set aside our foolish desires. We all have aspirations and desires in life to be this or to be that. I did. I come up. Uh, in a very adverse condition in the South, in the cotton fields and so forth. And I wanted to get away from that. And I did, but I didn't do it through God's will. I did it through what I presumably is my own will. Didn't know at the time, but it was God's will all the time. He wanted to take me through those valleys and peaks and highs and lows and bring me down. Then I could really deter, you know, to give my life to him. So he molded me in the shape that he wanted me to be. And uh, sometimes we want to get out here and, and, and do things and, and say things. Well, don't just say something. Do something. Do something with your life. Turn it over to Jesus. And God will let you know what he wants you to do in his life. This study is very important to those that are going through trying times right now because so many are caught up in conflicts and situations that it appears you have no way out. Well, I say Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. And if you follow his uh, steps through the Holy Word, through the scripture, then he will lead you out of darkness into that marvelous light. I work with people in many settings. Uh, I've been asked questions like these. I will answer as many as sort of these questions as possible. When God spoke 
they knew it was God. They knew what God was saying. They knew what they were to do in response. When God speaks, you hear his voice. You know it was God speaking to you. But then, do you respond to God? You see, you 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 got to make a decision. Some people hear God speaking. It's like a train going by on a railroad track going by your house every day. That train, you know it's coming through. You hear the train, the whistle. Do you respond to it? Sometimes it just becomes... You, it's normal. We have planes that fly over Inglewood. And when we first moved into Inglewood, it was annoying. But then you get used to it and you don't even recognize it. But sometimes when God speaks to us, and he speaks often to us through circumstances, through sickness and disease, through pain and suffering, through financial situations, crisis, but we ignore them. We say it's, you know, it's one of those things. But then when you hear him and you respond to him and allow him to move in your life and allow him to work that situation out, that's when you're beginning to know and do the will of God. God is always at work around you. He's at work every day. He doesn't stop working. God uh, continues to invite you into his uh, work area. He continues to extend that invitation for you to come and join him. And he's not going to uh, join you if you, you think God's going to give up uh, what he's doing to come and join you in something that's not going to last. That's not going to happen. God works through his servants. There are always people that God works through. In the Bible, God sent many prophets, evangelists, preachers, and teachers, even today. But do we listen to them? Do we hear what God is saying? Uh, he speaks to reveal himself, his purpose, and his ways. And so that's always, that's why it's good for us to be involved in the body of Christ, the, the, the camaraderie, the friendship, the love and fellowship that we have. When we join a Christian fellowship, you find a good church that you can go to that has the love of God. And you'll know that when you walk through those doors, if there's love uh, in that, per in that uh, particular uh, place that you're going to, because you can feel the love. You have a discernment. When God's children walk in and meet other God's children, there's a discernment that comes that brings a spirit of peace over you. Peace. Perfect peace. This peace I give to you. No man can give you that, but only through the Spirit of God. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I will reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face. You see, uh, God will talk directly to you. In the Old Testament, they felt like they had to go through the priest, the high priest to get to God. But that was destroyed when Jesus came and died upon the cross. That veil was torn. That curtain that separated us from God was torn, ripped apart so that we can now go directly to him. Jesus walked this earth so that we could speak directly to him. But he couldn't cover all the areas. He couldn't speak to all the people. It would have been too much for him. But he said something that was very important to all of us. I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. But when I come again, I'm coming back. But in the meantime, I'm going to leave you a comforter. I'm going to leave you a counselor. 
somebody that will be with you day and night, wherever you go. That's every individual on the face of the earth. If you want to accept him as Lord of your life, he will be your comforter. He'll be your shadow, following you everywhere you go and telling you what's right and what's wrong. And then when you get in trouble, he will step even in front of you and shield you from that trouble, that hurt or pain. Because as a human individual, none of us are perfect. As Romans said, we all have sinned and come short of the, God, uh, short of the glory of God. And we'll continue to do that until Christ comes back. Because we're human. He's divine. He's perfect. We're not. So God works through his servant. And he works through Moses in this particular way, situation to go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what can I do? He, he anointed Moses to do that. But what can I do one little person on my own? What did Dr. King do when he went to Memphis? What did Rosa Parks do when she sat on the bus and said, I'm not getting up? That was one person, one individual in this century that you can say that God had led them in a the direction that he wanted them to go. And even George Floyd, he, even though he lost his life, was martyred. It was God's will that he cried for his mother. It was God's will that he gave his life so that you and I might live because it broke the spell of slavery and, 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 and racism in America that the world could see. That was God at work. And how did we respond? We said, we're not gonna take it anymore. Every life matters. Black lives matter. And so we started a revolution that has changed the course of history. Could God work in extraordinary ways through your life to accomplish significant things for his kingdom? Yes, he can. He's waiting for that person. As, all the, as I say, all the troubles that we have in our world today, God is waiting for somebody to step up, take the mantle, and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Send me. And I'm not afraid. Not worried about the life that you live. Not worried about being beat up. Not worried about being shot. But standing on the word of God. I'm so uh, thankful to hear Dr. King in his speeches the other day say, I've been to the mountaintop. I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But my people are going to get to the promised land because I sacrificed, I gave it all to my Lord and Savior. And I finished my course. Now there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. When you're in the will of God, this old fleshly body may perish. Like Stephen was laying there and they were stoning him. Saul standing there holding his coat. And they were stoning him, and Stephen looked up into heaven. He said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I commend my spirit. Lord, 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 Saul. Stephen laid down, went to sleep, and went on to be with the Lord. The stones were tearing his body apart, but he didn't feel a thing because the power of God was on him. Lay not this sin on them, Lord. And that's what we as individuals, as Christians, should do. Because the world is full of sin. Satan has his agents all over the world. God gave him this territory. But he gave it this territory so that he could find out who's who. To be able to separate the wheat from the shaft. And to find out that those that are going to spend eternity with him, when he comes back, in that place that Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare for you. And when I go to there, I'm coming back for you, but I'm not coming back for the sinner. 
I'm not coming back for that guy that wants to do his will. I'm coming back for all of those that all know my will and want to do my will. And when we reach that point, we can look forward to those pearly gates. This study is very important. As we finish this unit, next week we'll be going into unit two, and that's looking to God. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalms 20 and 7. That's your verse to remember. Psalms 20 and 7. Beginning next week's study, that's our memory verse. It's been a pleasure to share with you the word of God tonight. And I pray that you have found something out of this presentation tonight that will uh, have an impact on your life and your life will have an impact on somebody else's life because truly that's what it's all about when we can reach that point in life where we stop worrying about our souls and worry about the souls that don't know Christ because there are a lot of them in this world today a lot of our children are being misled and misguided abused and misused and we can do something about it when we share with them the word of God the Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from that so we have to start training our children now not let that computer that uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter and all the rest chat boxes, all the things that have an impact on our children. Not let that be the main source of their learning and their spiritual walk. It's amazing how many of our children don't know Christ today and how many have come to the conclusion that there is no God. That has to change. And we as Christians are going to be held accountable for those things that we know to be true but turn our heads because of society, because of uh, prejudices and, and societal uh, influences. We have to make that decision to be right with Christ. We have to be the one that sets the standards, not let the world set the standards for us to live by. So next week we will definitely get into the uh, study and Prepare yourself. Make sure that you get uh, this textbook, that you can read it for yourself. It's a very important part of your study, experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God, Henry Blackaby. You can buy it at your local bookstores. You can also uh, go online. Uh, Amazon has a sale on right now. You can pick it up. And that will be a valuable tool for you, not just doing this study, but any study at any time, you can always refer back to this study. If you put your mind and your heart into it, God will meet you there and he'll come out with you. I'm Thomas Blackwell. This is Experiencing God. We hope that you've had a, a beautiful time this evening. You can go back and review this tape over and over again. It'll be posted on Facebook, uh, not Facebook, YouTube, at any time, Experiencing God, KTYM. And uh, you'll be able to pull that up anywhere in the world. Tell a friend. Love somebody. Do something good for somebody. And God will bless you. We're going to show you that uh, final clip for the young man that uh, had a hard time. Uh, it's all in a print. But I hope you get the message. I'm Thomas Blackwell. That's the way it is. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. We bow down.